noise noise for implementation, always noise for back for the institute. Uh, so uh, this, this talk on embarrassed bit is not really a uh, transport. Uh, maybe some experiments on transport in the field uh, in the future. So uh, like there's just something planned to be totally developed. Uh, so uh, this is some work uh, with a, a couple of former UBC postdocs. Uh, Armin Armani is now a professor at Washington University, and uh, Nina Sulin is a uh, Microsoft uh, station Q in Santa Barbara. Uh, so this is an outline of the talk. Uh, I want to uh, do some motivation, experimental motivation, and uh, introduce the model. Uh, we have a predicted phase diagram, which is based uh, largely on uh, combination of uh, uh, mean field theory approaches and, and some field theory normalization group. Uh, there's some various phase transitions and critical points I want to discuss uh, when we come to these conclusions. Uh, so uh, this is the general field of uh, myelina fermions, which has become a popular topic in matter physics in recent years. Um, so myelina fermions were originally proposed uh, in high energy physics and, and uh, there's no candidates for you know, but there's no uh, experimental evidence that uh, iron on fermions exist in high energy. No but uh, there have been lots of uh, proposals from iron on fermions in the matter to this, and they've been apparently uh, observed, although it still remains a little bit controversial perhaps. And uh, there are also candidates for qubits, uh, and they're actually the main focus of, uh, of Microsoft's uh, efforts to uh, make the. Uh, oh, better. So uh, the, the situation in which they been apparently observed uh, is the following one. This was originally by the Kavanaugh uh, group in Delft and then, uh, also by Blue uh, Israel and Marcus and people playing in the uh, So uh, my runner fermions are predicted to exist at the interface of a topological superconductor and normal wire. And uh, you can produce a topological. Uh, and then putting a wire across it that has a strong uh, spin orbit uh, interactions, and then applying a magnetic field, and uh, there's an induced superconductivity in the uh, quantum wire, and uh, in the right range of magnetic field, it can go into what's called the uh, uh, topological superconducting phase. And in this phase, there are predicted to exist uh, Majorana modes at uh, basically the edges uh, of the uh, region where the wire is on top of the superconductor. So basically, this is an interface between a superconducting region and a norm normal region with a quantum wire, and the runner fermions are predicted to exist uh, at those places. Uh, so if you write down the simplest possible low-energy Hamiltonian uh, for this system, ignoring the uh, low-energy states in the quantum wire, which are also actually important, but if we just ignore them, uh, then uh, the Hamiltonian can be written in the following way. So we have two Majorana modes, gamma 1 and gamma 2, or two Majorana operators which are at the left and right hand side of the uh, topological superconductor. So these are fermionic operators, but they have the unusual property that they're uh, Hermitian. So gamma I dagger equals gamma I. Uh, and uh, put clear gamma I squared is, uh, is one. And they obey these anti-commutation relations, which are more or less standard. So uh, we can combine two Majorana modes, or Majorana operators to make an ordinary uh, complex fermion operator, which I will call a Dirac operator. Uh, in this way. And uh, this Hamiltonian can be re rewritten in terms of the Dirac operator in this uh, standard form. So we see that there are actually just two uh, states in the Hilbert space where this Dirac operator, the Dirac state is either filled or empty with energy uh, plus or minus uh, T. And these, these two states have the unusual property that they kind of exist simultaneously in both ends uh, of the uh, topological uh, superconductor. And uh, thi these two states are a potential uh, qubit. If you uh, calculate the uh, interaction strength T between these two Majorana modes, uh, or this coupling strength, uh, it actually drops off exponentially with the length of the quantum wire, where C is the coherence length. So th this, this could be a very low energy uh, excitation. So uh, it's been proposed. Uh, one could actually get a macroscopic number of Majorana modes. Uh, if we have a, a layer of ordinary superconductor uh, sitting on top of a strong 
topological insulator uh, in a magnetic field. So now we can a vortex lattice uh, in the uh, in the superconductor, uh, and it's predicted that there'll be a Majorana mode at the core of each vortex. So uh, this is maybe not completely surprising because my Majorana modes tend to uh, appear at the interface of a normal and superconducting region, as we saw in the first example, and uh, we can think of the core of a vortex as being a normal region. So uh, perhaps not surprising that a Majorana mode exists uh, in the core. Uh, so the Majorana modes can uh, have basically, they can sort of hop in a sense from site, from vortex to vortex or site to site, and they can also have interactions. And uh, the interactions are predicted to be short range and again to drop off exponentially with the uh, coherence length uh, in the superconductor. So th this, this is a kind of interesting uh, situation uh, to study theoretically and uh, we hope experimentally. Uh, and uh, we've studied the simplest uh, possible uh, model you could write down involving uh, these, uh, th this uh, uh, macroscopic number of Majorana modes. And uh, we, we've been considered the shortest possible range interactions. So in that sense, it's rather like the Hubbard model. So we call this the Majorana-Hubbard model. Uh, and uh, the work I will present today is on the square lattice, uh, but we're also working on the triangular lattice case, which is maybe more relevant for most superconductors. Well, there are some superconductors that have a square lattice of, of vortices, so uh, both cases could be relevant. We also did some work uh, previously on the one-dimensional case, which I'll mention briefly at the end. So the one-dimensional case is uh, under much better control, uh, theoretically, than the two-dimensional case. So uh, this is the Hamiltonian uh, we write down. So we have a, uh, a nearest neighbor hopping term. So MN dislabel points in the square lattice. So this is the nearest neighbor hopping term. Uh, we include the shortest possible range interactions we can write down. Uh, and uh, because the square of a Majorana mode is one, uh, we actually have to have interactions on f at least four, well, on four lattice sites. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to compare this to the Hubbard model. So Hubbard model, we have fermions with spins, so we can have interactions on a single site. If we have uh, spinless Dirac fermions, then the interactions have to be on, uh, on two sites. So the, the simplest model you can write down is nearest neighbor interactions. Uh, but for Majorana fermions, uh, because gamma squared is one, uh, to get a non-trivial interaction, we have to involve four lattice sites. So the shortest possible range interaction is on a plaquette for the square lattice. And that's the case we've studied. Uh, you might wonder about this uh, strange minus sign in the hopping term. Uh, this is actually determined by the condition that we have one flux quantum per plaquette that fixes the sign of the nearest neighbor hopping term. We've also considered a second neighbor hopping term. Uh, and again, uh, these are on diagonals. And again, the signs are fixed um, by uh, this uh, flux quantum uh, condition. And it turns out that the second neighbor hopping term actually lowers the symmetry of the model and changes the behavior uh, potentially quite strongly, as I'll uh, explain. Uh, another peculiar feature about this, which I'll, uh, w actually, which we can kind of understand fairly easily, is that uh, positive G actually corresponds to um, attractive interactions and uh, negative G to repulsive interactions. This just has to do with the fact that if you multiply two Majorana modes together, you basically get I times uh, C dagger C minus one. So you get two factors of I coming in, and it leads to this uh, sign change. So uh, this model and its generalizations represents a significant uh, theoretical challenge, uh, maybe somewhat similar to the two-dimensional uh, Hubbard model. Two-dimensional Hubbard model people have been struggling to solve for the last uh, 30 years or, or so, especially since uh, high TC superconductors came along, and I think there's still some controversy about the phase diagram. Um, so th this model actually has less symmetry than the Hubbard model. There's no U1 symmetry, which potentially makes it a bit more difficult to, to study. It does have the advantage that there's no possible chemical potential term you can add. So there are fewer parameters in the model. So the only dimensional, dimensionless parameter if we have only the nearest neighbor hopping is just this ratio G over T. Uh, there's a Monte Carlo sign problem. So uh, it's going to be probably not feasible to do Monte Carlo. Uh, it, w one could probably apply density matrix normalization group methods. In fact, we are trying to apply them to study uh, ladders if you have not too many legs. Uh, and, uh, and this is work I've been doing. Uh, so uh, the, the work on the one-dimensional case we actually studied with uh, Romani uh, 
uh, Zhu and uh, Marcel Franz, and uh, we've extended this to the two-dimensional case. <coughs> so the one-dimensional case, we could actually study the behavior quite accurately using a uh, density matrix normalization group, but it's uh, challenging to extend it to two dimensions. So the results I'm talking about today are just based on a combination of mean field theory and uh, field theory normalization group arguments. <coughs> and uh, to make the model more realistic, we might want to consider things like uh, disorder. Uh <coughs> so maybe the vortex lattice won't be perfectly regular. And there might even be some lattice distortions induced by the Majorana Hamiltonian that might uh, lower the energy, so like a spin pyrroles distortion. But we're ignoring all these things uh, at present. So one of the fascinating things about this situation is it's been predicted that one can actually tune the hopping parameters to zero by adjusting a gate voltage in the topological insulator. Um, basically, you can tune the topological insulator to a special symmetry point uh, where the hopping terms vanish. So uh, the dimensionless parameter, uh, if we ignore the second neighbor hopping for the moment, is just the ratio of g over t. And this, in principle, could be tuned to infinity by adjusting a gate voltage. Uh, so therefore, it's of interest to study the phase diagram uh, as a function of, of g over t. Uh, so I'll begin by discussing a case where T2 is zero, uh, and then I'll come back and discuss the effects of the second neighbor hopping uh, later. Uh, because the hopping parameters are expected to drop off exponentially with the coherence length, uh, there is some hope that the second neighbor hopping might be relatively small compared to nearest neighbor. So uh, this is our predicted uh, phase diagram. Uh, so there's a, uh, a gapless phase where interactions are irrelevant. Uh, at least when T2 is zero. Uh, and then we have uh, some broken symmetry phases that occur at stronger coupling. So, uh, and uh, there's a tendency of Majorana modes to want to combine together to form ordinary Dirac fermions uh, to lower the energy. That's our kind of mean field picture of some of these broken symmetry phases. So we have what we call a ferromagnetic uh, Majorana mode pairing phase, which I'll explain. And then we also have a, an anti-ferromagnetic uh, Majorana mode pairing phase. And then we have another broken symmetry phase that has broken time reversal but doesn't really have pairing up of Majoranus. Uh, and uh, so we're predicting four phases. And uh, these two phase transitions are, uh, are continuous. They're second order transitions. And this one in particular we predict is supersymmetric. And then we have a first order transition occurring at uh, strong uh, repulsive uh, interactions. So uh, it's not entirely clear which sign of G would be appropriate for the experiments because uh, the uh, Majorana modes exists on top of a, a superconductor, and the effective electron electron interactions are attractive in a superconductor, so uh, we study both, both signs uh, of the interactions. This uh, I'm going to come to that point. Yeah. Good question. Uh, that's a very important and interesting point. Uh, and th this is the phase diagram when T2 is zero, uh, and uh, T2 may certainly change this to some extent, and I'll be also discussing the effects of that. So yeah, now let me come to the uh, symmetries and broken symmetry phases. So this model actually has very limited uh, symmetries. Um, and you might ask what symmetries can be spontaneously broken at these critical points. So the model has symmetry translation by one site in the x or y direction. Even this isn't totally obvious because the hopping term actually, hopping term in the x direction actually changes sign when you translate in the y direction. But combining translation with uh, changing the signs of the Majoranus on some of the lattice sites, uh, we have a uh, translation symmetry. We also ha have a rot pi over 2 rotation symmetry I if we again put in some appropriate minus signs in some of the Majorana modes. So these are the only symmetries actually if we don't have second neighbor hopping. I if, if we have second neighbor hopping, I mean. If, if uh, T2 is zero, we also have time reversal symmetry, as I'll explain. Uh, and we have a parity or spatial reflection symmetry. And uh, even if T2 is non-zero, the product of these two is actually a symmetry uh, PT. So in addition to these uh, exact symmetries, we also have some very important emergent symmetries in the low energy effective field theory. And these emergent symmetries are playing a very important role in these uh, phase transitions that we're predicting. And I'll, I'll get to these uh, shortly. So you might ask, well, why might you get uh, broken translation symmetry? Okay, there's a tendency of Majorana modes to sort of pair up and make uh, Dirac fermions to lower the energy. Um, and this can be understood at kind of a mean field uh, level. So as I already discussed, if we uh, combine a couple of Majorana modes together, we can make uh, Dirac fermion. So if you only had uh, 
hopping term on every second uh, nearest neighbor pair, uh, and we ignored interactions, then uh, we would have a very trivial state. So we would just, the Hamiltonian can be rewritten as a sum of terms like this. And if T is positive, which we'll uh, always assume, but lots of generality, then the ground state would simply have all of these uh, rack levels empty. So this would be kind of a mean field ground state where we've paired up Majoranas to form Dirac fermions, and then the Dirac fermion levels are simply all empty if we take uh, T to be uh, positive. But uh, in fact, uh, there isn't any natural pairing of Majorana fermions because we have translational symmetry in the model. So if we want to pair up Majoranas, we necessarily have to break translational symmetry. Uh, and, uh, but we find there's a tendency for this to happen, and this can be s sort of, this can help us to understand uh, some of these broken translation symmetry phases. So in the square lattice, for example, we could combine uh, pairs of Majoranas on site M2n, M2n plus 1, so this would be a vertical pairing of Majoranas, or 2n minus 1, 2n, and depending on which way we do it, we've broken, well, either, either way breaks the translation symmetry. So we've confirmed uh, quite clearly that such uh, breaking of translation symmetry occurs in the one-dimensional case, and uh, we're hypothesizing it also occurs in the two-dimensional case. <coughs> So this pairing also breaks rotational symmetry because these nearest neighbor pairs will be vertical or, or horizontal. So uh, we refer to either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic uh, pairing phases. So, so this pairing phase we call ferromagnetic because uh, we've uh, combined pairs of Majoranas in this way to make uh, Dirac fermions, and the empty circles uh, designate that at a mean field level, at least these uh, Dirac levels are empty. So we have the same uh, state for uh, neighboring pairs, so we call this a ferromagnetic uh, phase. And uh, th this corresponds to uh, this uh, order parameter which breaks the translation symmetry. Uh, so we have uh, uh, th this uh, amplitude will be larger uh, on these, uh, actually I, I guess will be smaller uh, on the, on the uh, pairs of sites where I've drawn the, uh, the circles where these Majoranas are paired up to form Dirac's. Um, and actually, you can understand why this phase would occur for positive G, because if you just take a, a plaquette interaction, uh, it's basically a product of uh, these uh, C dagger C, C dagger C minus 1 interactions. And uh, with an attractive interaction, the ground state energy will be lower if, if we uh, have the same uh, empty state for these uh, pairs of Dirac fermions. So altogether, we have four ground states of this type, because we can... Uh, translate by one site in the vertical direction, or we can also rotate and get two states that are rotated. So we've paired up the Majoranas on the horizontal uh, links. Uh, we can also get anti-ferromagnetic pairing, as we call it, which we claim is favored for G less than zero. And now we find that, again, uh, we combine up pairs of Majoranas to make Dirac fermions. But now we find that uh, neighboring Dirac fermions, this, this state will be filled, this state will be empty. So this is kind of a charge density wave state. And again, this just happens because when G is... Uh, negative at a mean field level, this will lower the energy <coughs> if we form this pattern. <coughs> so in this case, we actually have eight ground states because uh, now we can translate in the x or the y direction and get a different state uh, because we have this charge density wave pattern. Or we can also rotate uh, by, by pi over 2. So uh, we've confirmed that uh, for both positive and negative g that these uh, pairing phases actually occur at strong coupling in both the two-leg and four-leg ladders where we can... Uh, we can find some essentially exact uh, results. Uh, but it's still a kind of a hypothesis that this occurs in the two-dimensional case. Uh, now let me mention uh, time reversal and what's so special about T2. So uh, time reversal, basically time reversal takes I to minus I. And the hopping term has an I in it. It's I T gamma 1 gamma 2. So uh, time reversal symmetry is only present if we also change the sign of uh, every second Majorana mode in, in the hopping terms. So if we have nearest neighbor hopping only, then we can just change the sign of gamma by a factor of minus 1 to the m plus n. And the nearest neighbor hopping term uh, couples together Majoranas, which uh, one of them picks up a minus sign and one doesn't. So this compensates for the i goes to minus i. So this will be the time reversal symmetry. But if t2 is 0, then we're coupling together Majoranas such that the sign will be the same for both of them. So therefore, the t2 term actually uh, breaks uh, time reversal. Uh, if T2 is zero, uh, we find that the symmetry can be spontaneously broken. So we effectively generate a, a second neighbor hopping, which breaks the time reversal symmetry. And this is one of the uh, broken symmetry phases in the phase diagram that I explained. <coughs> so this actually explains all of the broken symmetry phases that we're claiming 
occur in this model. We, ha we have these phases characterized by Majorana's combining together to form Dirac's and then forming this pattern of uh, Dirac levels that are empty or filled. Uh, and uh, th these lead to these ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic Majorana pairing phases. And then we have this uh, broken time reversal phase that does not really correspond to Majorana's forming pairs, but instead to sort of spontaneously breaking time reversal and generating an effect of uh, second neighbor hopping. So uh, these analytic results uh, we confirmed on two-leg and four-leg ladders, uh, and they're consistent with these uh, predictions. And uh, th the original paper we wrote on the mean field theory predicted all of these phases, but there was a slight – one of the phases was slightly different than what I've shown you today. And uh, this, this came from uh, looking at the two-leg and four-leg ladders, and there was a slight change in one of these phases, but uh, they're essentially what's in our paper. So uh, now let me talk about uh, the field theory uh, normalization group approach and the nature of these critical points. So first of all, if you take the non-interacting model, uh, obviously you can solve it exactly. Uh, and uh, one gets uh, two energy bands, uh, one for positive energy, one for negative energy. And they have uh, these energies. So in particular, when T2 is zero, uh, we have uh, gapless points. Um, and uh, near the gapless points, we have a relativistic uh, dispersion relation, a uh, linear dispersion relation. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the Boolean zone, uh, be because uh, we have uh, translation symmetry is, is only present if we translate by two sites in the uh, vertical direction because of this alternation, sign alternation of the hopping term, the, the Boolean zone in the y direction only extends over pi. And uh, rather strangely, the Boolean zone in the x direction also only extends over pi. And this actually reflects the fact that we're dealing with Majorana fermions. Uh, so we can sort of uh, combine, well, we can Fourier transform Majorana fermions. The result of Fourier transform, maybe I'll write this in the blackboard. <coughs> so we can Fourier transform a Majorana fermion over R. Uh, but now you see that the Fourier transform is not uh, Hermitian anymore. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, gamma minus k is gamma k dagger. So uh, basically, we can write the Hamiltonian entirely in terms of these gamma k's and their Hermitian conjugates. Uh, but uh, because of this condition, the Bullman zone sort of gets cut in half by, by this uh, effect. So uh, we can restrict ourselves to half the Bullman zone, only uh, kx between 0 and pi uh, once we Fourier transform. And uh, th this halving of the Bullman zone is sort of a consequence of, of dealing with these Majorana fermions. So uh, we actually have two gapless points when t2 is 0, and these are at uh, kx, ky equals 0, 0, and, uh, and pi 0. And uh, if we assume t2 is small, then near these points, uh, we have a relativistic dispersion relation. So if t2 is 0, we have a massless uh, fermionic dispersion rela relativistic massless fermions. And if T2 is non-zero, we have massive uh, fermions. Uh, so it's a little bit like uh, graphene where, where uh, we get two valleys. But unlike graphene, these are actually Majorana modes, uh, not Dirac modes. Uh, so we basically have two, Meyer, two relativistic Majorana fermions in the low energy effective theory. And because we have two of them, we can actually combine them together to form a Dirac fermion. So uh, the low energy theory is equivalent to having one uh, Dirac fermion. And this is already a little bit unusual because uh, most uh, um, condensed matter realizations of, uh, of relativistic fermions, or, or, and these are often used in doing numerical simulations in high energy physics, uh, there's something called the nielsen ninomiya uh, theorem, which says that one always gets an even number of Dirac fermions starting from any kind of a, a lattice model. But in this case, we're only getting a single Dirac fermion. And this is basically a consequence of the fact that we've broken the U1 symmetry. We started with Majorana fermions, and this leads to a theory with a single uh, Dirac fermion. So it's already an unusual feature of this model. So if you write down the low energy uh, effect of Lagrangian, it takes the following form. So ignoring the interaction terms, we just get a standard uh, relativistic Lagrangian in two plus one dimension. Gammas are the three-dimensional, two-dimensional gamma matrices. We're in the two plus, one, two, two plus one dimensional relativistic field theory. And if you write down the lowest uh, dimension interaction, 
uh, it actually takes the following form, psi bar psi squared. Uh, and this is rather remarkable for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's an emergent Lorentz invariance, which is present even when we include the interactions. And furthermore, there's an emergent E1 symmetry because uh, this term actually preserves E1. We can make a uh, phase rotation on psi, psi, psi bar of psi dagger gamma zero. So this is invariant under a phase rotation on psi. If you write down higher dimension terms uh, for Fermi interactions with derivatives, then there will be terms that actually break the U1 symmetry. So there are terms that have four psi's and no psi daggers that have derivatives, but these are e even more irrelevant uh, interactions. So this psi bar psi squared is already an irrelevant interaction in two plus one dimensions, and the terms that break the U1 symmetry and break the Lorentz invariance are even more uh, irrelevant. So in some sense, there appears to be an emergent uh, U1 uh, symmetry uh, in this low energy theory, as well as an emergent uh, Lorentz invariance. So I if the bare coupling is small enough, then it will simply normalize to zero, and we'll have a low energy phase, which is just corresponds to three uh, massless fermions, and this is the phase in the phase diagram near g equals zero, which I already mentioned. Uh, to understand what might happen if the interactions become strong enough, it's convenient to write them two different ways. So psi one and psi two are the two components uh, of these uh, relativistic Majorana fermions. I should mention the reason we get two components is because there were two Dirac points. Uh, also, actually, that's not really the reason. The reason is, well, because we have two Dirac points, but partly because we have uh, the broken translation symmetry. So we have, uh, um, we have two, two components arising from translation uh, in the y direction. So th this leads to a two component uh, Dirac fermion. Uh, and uh, we can write the interaction either this way or this way. So we see that if G is positive, uh, this would tend to favor a, uh, a, phase, a superfluid phase where psi 1, psi 2 has an expectation value. This corresponds to spontaneous breaking of U1. But if uh, G is negative, then the order parameter would tend to be psi bar psi, and this breaks time reversal. So this is the reason we predict a broken time reversal phase for positive G, which is actually repulsive interactions and uh, a broken emergent U1 symmetry uh, for uh, positive G, which corresponds to uh, attractive uh, interactions. So what's unusual about this is the U1 symmetry, which gets broken at this critical point, is actually an emergent U1. It's not an exact symmetry. And uh, the, the phase with broken U1 symmetry corresponds to our ferromagnetic Majorana pairing phase in our lattice picture. So when T2 is zero and we have time reversal, the fermions are actually massless uh, in this uh, phase with G less than GC, that this is for positive G. Uh, and uh, therefore, at the superfluid transition, so normally at a superfluid transition, we have a massless boson. This is basically the order parameter, uh, psi 1, psi 2. Uh, and if you do any kind of a mean field uh, calculation at, at the critical point, uh, we, we can introduce a, a boson field, at the order parameter. And uh, the mass for the boson field vanishes at the critical point. So we expect to have a massless charged boson uh, at the critical point. But if T2 is zero, we also have a massless fermion at the critical point. So this is a very unusual U1 critical point that has both a massless fermion and a massless boson. And this critical point has been studied previously in a different uh, condensed matter context. And it was argued that there's an emergent uh, supersymmetry at the critical point, which is made possible by the fact that we have massless fermions as well as bosons. Uh, and uh, so what happens actually is that the, uh, the uh, coupling constants have to renormalize at the critical point in such a way uh, that we recover the supersymmetry. So supersymmetry relates fermions and bosons, uh, and uh, it predicts that we have uh, equivalent fermions and bosons, both of which are massless uh, at the critical point. So what's rather remarkable about this transition in this context is that uh, it's all connected with this breaking of U1 symmetry. And the U1 symmetry is actually emergent, so it's not an exact U1 symmetry, it's an emergent U1 symmetry. But nonetheless, we, we find, we, we've done renormalization group calculations at the critical point, and we find that the, uh, the operators that break the U1 symmetry are irrelevant at the critical point, although the psi bar psi squared term becomes uh, relevant at the critical point, it drives the transition. But the other terms that break the U1 symmetry are irrelevant, and therefore, this emergent U1 symmetry we think becomes exact at the critical point, and we can get this supersymmetry. So there's a question of what happens if we include T2. So if we include T2, we, uh, we give the fermions a mass. And now we might expect that this critical point would not be uh, supersymmetric anymore. It might be a more conventional uh, U1 critical point. But we tried to study this with epsilon expansion uh, as yet unpublished results. And uh, uh, our latest results as of last week actually suggest that uh, 
the, the supersymmetric critical point may actually be stable even when we include the fermion mass. Um, but that's still somewhat up in the air. So for g less than zero and t2 equals zero, the order parameter is psi bar psi. And now what we're finding is that it's strong enough uh, repulsive interactions, g less than zero, time reversal gets spontaneously broken. This corresponds to generating a, an effective second neighbor hopping term. Uh, and uh, this ag again is another type of second order phase transition. And in the field theory, it corresponds to generating spontaneously a mass term uh, for these Dirac fermions. So this second order transition has been studied in the context of this relativistic field theory, two plus one dimensions, and it it's goes under the name of the Yukawa gauss neville model. So critical exponents have been predicted using the epsilon expansion both at the supersymmetric transition and also at this uh, yukawa gauss neville transition. So we can predict to, to some extent uh, critical points at these, these phase transition uh, points. So uh, I'm almost at the end of my talk actually. Let, let me just uh, mention um, the phase diagram in the one-dimensional case. Uh, so uh, in the one-dimensional case, this is not based on mean field theory, although actually we found mean field theory was very helpful, also the one-dimensional case. But here we were able to confirm it using uh, density matrix normalization group calculations. Uh, and again, we found that uh, for small enough g, the interactions were irrelevant, and there was a phase. And in this case, the phase corresponded to this one uh, relativistic Majorana fermion. And uh, a relativistic Majorana, massless relativistic Majorana fermion uh, in uh, one, plus I one plus one dimensions is, is equivalent to the Ising, quantum Ising model. So we call this the Ising phase. For a strong enough positive g, we found that we went into a phase that again had a kind of uh, broken translation symmetry. Ag again, Majoranas were combining to form Dirac's. Again, this was sort of a ferromagnetic phase, uh, which was too twofold degenerate. Uh, in this case, we found that the the critical point was a tricriticalizing model. And this tricriticalizing model is actually also supersymmetric. So this transition is also supersymmetric in the one plus one dimensional case. And uh, now we found that uh, close to the critical point, but slightly above the critical coupling uh, where we generate a mass, we, we find that the, uh, the term which drives the transition, in fact, all of the relevant terms at this critical point are actually supersymmetry preserving. So this actually corresponds to a phase that has a uh, uh, a broken uh, Z2 symmetry, but actually has a uh, exact supersymmetry. So this is kind of a, a massive uh, supersymmetric phase that can occur in this part of the phase diagram. Uh, for negative G, we found a kind of a Lifshitz uh, transition uh, where basically the linear term in the dispersion relation vanished. At this point, the dispersion relation becomes cubic, low energies. Uh, and then we found a phase occurring uh, where there was an emergent uh, U1 symmetry again. And this phase actually had a, uh, a Dirac fermion and a Majorana fermion. So it's, uh, in terms of the conformal anomaly parameter C, C equals three halves. Uh, so it corresponds to a Luttinger liquid theory uh, and a kind of a decoupled Majorana fermion. And uh, as we uh, move across this part of the phase diagram, we find that the uh, K Fermi, which characterizes the uh, Dirac fermions, actually changes continuously. It's not governed by any kind of uh, chemical potential because we can't add one to this model. Uh, and then we have a, eventually have another transition, uh, a kind of generalized commensurate and commensurate transition into a, what you might call the uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, pairing phase where again, Majoranas are combining to form Dirac's but now they have a kind of alternating empty and filled uh, phase diagram. So this tendency of Majoranas to form Dirac's we've actually confirmed quite clearly numerically in the one dimensional case and it does seem to be a general tendency of Majorana fermions. So uh, let me just put up some conclusions. So uh, two-dimensional models of interacting Majorana fermions have experimental realizations in topological insulator superconductor systems. The hopping parameter can in principle be tuned to zero by adjusting a gate voltage, making the uh, strong coupling phase diagram uh, accessible. And uh, this is the phase diagram we, we predict. Uh, so four different phases uh, a gapless phase at weak enough coupling, uh, a spontaneous breaking of this emergent U1 symmetry, which we claim is supersymmetric into a ferromagnetic pairing phase. Uh, if T2 is zero, then we have a broken time reversal phase. Uh, and even if T2 is not zero, we eventually get this phase that has an anti-ferromagnetic uh, Majorana mode pairing and broken uh, translation symmetry. So that's it. Thanks for your attention.
very much. Uh, questions? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so, what do the Majorana interactions look like in your one D model? In two uh, D, they had to yeah. go around the plaquette. Yeah, they have right? to be so on four sites. So they're they're just um, just sum over J of uh, gamma J gamma J plus one gamma J plus two gamma J plus three. And the, uh, the Majorana pairing phases look like this. So we can basically combine uh, Majoranas together in, in uh, pairs. And the ferromagnetic phase uh, looks like this. And there's two phases we can break. We have broken translation symmetry. The, uh, for uh, repulsive uh, interactions, we get a charge density phase that, wave phase that looks like this. And this is actually fourfold degenerate because we, again, we have to decide how we combine the Majoranas to make the racks. And there's two ways of doing it. And in this case, we can have. We have a charge density wave, so there's a, a, an additional twofold degeneracy. Thank you. Are there any further questions? About the phase with broken time reversal symmetry, yep. uh, it, does it have a Cairo edge mode? Is it topological in any sense? Um, okay, let's see. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you looked at that question carefully. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if it's similar to the gap phase in the Kitaev model on the honeycomb lattice. Yeah, actually, you're probably right. There probably is some connection. So, yeah, there, that's it, then it would have. Except there may be, there may be an issue about which way you. There is an issue about which way you combine them. Well, uh, actually, in this case, we're not combining Majoranas to form Dirac. So, yes, you're probably right. There may be gapless edge states in that case. Yes, good point. Can you maybe say a little bit more about the, the SUSI theory at the critical point? Uh, do you know anything of the Lagrangian? Is it the, is it the supersymmetric Wilson-Fisher point, or is it a different uh, No, it's not theory? the Wilson-Fisher point. It has different critical exponents. Uh, there have been a number of uh, studies of these. So uh, I mean, you can write down a supersymmetric uh, massive theory. The fermion and the boson have, to have the same mass, and they, ha they have interactions. So there's a, uh, yeah, you can write the Lagrangian. So I should mention it's a little bit mysterious we have any sort of uh, bosons here because we started entirely with fermions. So the idea is we can introduce this boson field phi, which is psi 1, psi 2. And uh, we can make a hubbard shikhanovich transformation. And the Lagrangian is basically uh, and then we have a We have a five-fourth interaction. We have a cubic interaction coupling the boson to the fermions. Uh, and these couplings, lambda and g, have to be the, the same, basically related to have supersymmetry. And more generally, we have a mass term for the fermion and boson. They would have to be the same. So at the critical point, the mass vanishes for both the fermion and the boson. And uh, also, in, in principle, in a condensed matter model, the velocities wouldn't have to be the same for the fermion and boson. But uh, these models have been studied in a somewhat different condensed matter context and some other condensed matter models that did have U1 symmetry. And it was found that the, even though the velocities might be different microscopically, they kind of were normalized to becoming the same at the critical point. And also, these coupling constants were normalized to the same values so that one recovers a, a kind of an emergent uh, supersymmetry at the critical point, even if it's not uh, exact in the lattice model. And we kind of extended that to the case where um, we actually don't have an exact U1 symmetry, which this model has. And we find that the U1 symmetry emerges and at the critical point, we have this emergent uh, supersymmetry as well. I just thought that this was the supersymmetric Wilson-Fisher and Lagrangian. Um, so that's well, I, wouldn't, I, I guess there's a Wilson-Fisher. Uh, maybe that's the terminology. I, I guess we're referring to Wilson-Fisher U1 critical point, which is kind of the standard critical point for breaking U1. In that case, the fermion has a mass. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not well sure I, if it's I, a standard notation. Yeah, perhaps it is. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, you said uh, you have to use uh, two fe Mariana fermions to e combine a Dirac fermion. I said, okay. Sorry, say that again. Uh, you said you can combine a Dirac fermion using two Mariana fermions. Yes. Yes. yes? Yeah. So, what kind of projection operator did you use in this model? Uh, it, well, that, that's that is actually straightforward because we can write the low energy Lagrangian in terms of Mariana's, but we can always combine together Mariana's to make Dirac's. You know, just gamma one plus i gamma two. 
So th that's just a straightforward uh, way of rewriting the Lagrangian. It's very similar to the Hanekab Kitaev model. Uh, yeah, I guess there are, there are some connections to that, I suppose, yes. So, thank you. If there is no other question, I can ask uh, one question as well. So you, so you uh, mentioned that you also wanted to uh, study other lattice geometries, yeah. so except uh, for, the, for the square lattice. So uh, what kind of uh, sort of changes uh, in, uh, do you expect? If, uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we have some preliminary results in the triangular case. Uh, I think the, the square lattice may be rather special in that one has so many broken symmetry phases. I, I think the other lattice geometries may be uh, less susceptible to broken symmetries. And we can kind of understand it in terms of the nature of the interactions and whether the energy is lowered by the Majoranas combining in pairs to form Dirac's. I think the geometry of the triangular lattice is probably less favorable for uh, these broken symmetry phases, but we're still trying to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see uh, no more sort of uh, raised hands, so I guess that uh, brings us uh, to, to the end. So let's uh, thank Ian again.